morning. It's always a privilege to be able to worship together and be able to preach God's word. And so as we uh, sit and hear from God this morning, let's look to God for help and strength. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to sit under your word this morning. And we pray, Lord, would you help us that our minds would be clear to understand and our hearts prepared to be convicted and changed by your word. Holy Spirit, I ask that you speak through me this morning, that it would not be my words, but your words for your people and for those who have yet to come to know Jesus as Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So what is your biggest fear? What are you most afraid of? You know, if you Google and do a Google search of fear, you get all types of interesting information that pops up. I came across a website that was uh, what Americans fear most according to their Google searches, and it was sorted by and listed by states. So let's do a little guessing game. What do you think Pennsylvania's top fear was in uh, 2021? Any guesses? Uh, not the pandemic. Anybody else? Well, if you guessed fear of water, that's what it was. And very interesting because I don't know a lot of large bodies of water in Pennsylvania. So interesting. What about the small state of Delaware? It was the fear of flying. It's probably why there's no airports in Delaware, right? <laughs> what about Texas? What's the fear for Texas? And no, it's not the fear of the eagles, okay? It's the fear of blood. And here's my two favorite that I found. Montana. Montana's fear is the fear of people, which <laughs> makes so much sense because that's why nobody lives there, right? And Wyoming is the fear of clowns, the fear of clowns. Now, all jokes, jokes aside, listen, when we ask about what your fear is, am I concerned about phobias? No, but I'm asking about what things in our life that really cause fear. You know, the fear that brings worry and stress and anxiety. The fears that cripple us, that can bring life to a halt. You know, we all have all types of uh, various fears and worries in our life. You know, for maybe for some of us, it's uh, a health diagnosis that brings the fear of the unknown and fear of uncertainty for the future. For some, it might be financial hardships and worry about how we're going to continue to sustain our family. And for others, it might be worry and anxiety over relationships, struggles in our marriage or with our children or with our friends. You know, there's plenty of things to worry about and fear in this world. Fear of wars and viruses and political landscapes, the fear of loneliness and the fear of guilt, and the list can go on and on and on. How do we handle the uncertainties that life brings us? How do we, what, what hope do we have in the fear and despair of life sometimes in this world? You know, as we come to this passage this morning, we find the disciples, Jesus' disciples, the ones that were closest to him, we find them hiding in a locked room, and they are in a state of utter fear and despair. Why are they in fear? Let's do a quick background. Here's these disciples. They were chosen by Jesus himself. And for a three-year period of time, they spent every single day with him. They became so close to him. Jesus taught them, and, and they watched Jesus do all types of miracles. He healed the sick. He raised people from the dead. He cast out demons. He literally walked on water, and he calmed a storm. So the disciples knew that Jesus wasn't just an ordinary man or an ordinary prophet. No, they knew that he was the long-awaited Messiah, their God. But they had an issue. They couldn't come to grips with why Jesus said he had to die. They didn't want to come to that place of understanding that or accepting that. So can you imagine when Jesus was arrested? 
when he was falsely accused, when he was dragged through six unlawful trials, when he was severely beaten and ultimately died by crucifixion at the hands of the Jewish and Roman leaders. Oh, the disciples, we can see why they were crushed. Their lives were turned upside down. They were grieving and confused about all that's happening, uncertain about their future. If the Jewish leaders could falsely accuse and put Jesus to death, what hope do these disciples have? And so they find themselves hiding in a room with doors shut, fearing for their very lives. Life has come to a stop, and they are crippled with fear. If any one of us were in their shoes and in their place, wouldn't we do the same thing? Wouldn't we hide? Wouldn't we be afraid? What do these disciples do in the face of uncertainty and fear? And church, this is what I love so much about this passage. They don't do anything, and they can't do anything. Jesus does everything. This morning, I want to look at one thing that Jesus does for his disciples and three things that Jesus gives to his disciples. One thing that he does and three things that he gives. First, what does Jesus do? Jesus draws near when we are afraid. Jesus draws near when we are afraid. Let's look at John chapter 20, verse 19. It says, On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. Can I remind you how the disciples treated Jesus the last time that they saw him alive? Do you remember? In Jesus' greatest hour of need, as he suffered and bled, as he was being led to be crucified, his disciples, the people that were closest to him, they abandoned him. They denied him. They were ashamed of him. But would you see the complete difference of our Lord and Savior. When Jesus resurrects from the grave on the third day, when he overcomes sin and death, what does Jesus do? Jesus comes to to the disciples in their hour of need, in their fear and panic. He comes to encourage them, and he comes to strengthen them. See, Jesus doesn't come yelling and screaming at them, how dare you deny me? How dare you abandon me? For three years you walked with me. And all of a sudden, things got hard and you want to walk away? That's not what Jesus said. We see Jesus not wanting to condemn or to make them feel bad, but he goes to strengthen and encourage them. That's the Savior we have, church. After Jesus was resurrected from the grave, we see Jesus encouraging a weeping and sobbing Mary at the tomb. And he turned her sorrow to joy. Last week, Pastor Binu uh, uh, preached to us how Jesus met two followers of Jesus who who were in despair and as they were walking the seven-mile road to Emmaus, and Jesus encouraged them, and he turned their despair into hope. And this week, we see Jesus come to his fearful and terrified disciples, and he is going to turn their fear into peace and joy. You see, nothing is going to stop Jesus from drawing near to us. See, not even a locked door is going to keep Jesus from his disciples. We don't hear that Jesus knocks on the door. We don't read that the disciples opened the door. No, Jesus goes right through the locked door, and he comes before his disciples. Jesus isn't a ghost, and he isn't a spirit. How do we know that? In verse 20, it says, when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Next week, when Pastor Jason preaches on on doubting Thomas, Thomas will put his finger in Jesus' hands. Jesus is standing in front of his disciples in the flesh as the risen king and savior. And by walking right through that shut door, Jesus was showing both to his disciples And he is showing us this morning that he can go where no one else can. And he can do what no one else can do. Church, he can reach us at 
anytime and anywhere. He can reach the deepest places of our heart and mind. And he can do what no one else can. Church, would you be encouraged this morning that in your hour of fear, as you cry out to Jesus, would you hear this promise from Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10? It says, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, and I will help you, and I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Church, when we fear, Jesus draws near. Let's look at three things that Jesus gives his fearful disciples. In this passage, we see three things. He gives them peace, he gives them purpose, and he gives them power. Peace, purpose, and power. And the order that Jesus gives this is very important because he first gives them peace. Jesus gives us peace. Would you see and uh, read John chapter 20, 19 to 21? It says, Jesus came and stood amongst them and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. Twice in this passage, three times in this chapter, Jesus says, peace be with you. This is not just a simple greeting of Jesus saying hello. No, the repetition tells us that it's much more. By giving them peace, it actually shows that the disciples didn't have it and that they needed it. And the Greek word for peace used in this, in this chapter, it actually denotes to a settled state of being or a settled calm between persons. Let's look at three ways that Jesus gives us peace. First, and most importantly, Jesus' death and resurrection settled peace between us and God. Jesus' death and resurrection settled peace between us and God. Why do we need peace with God? The Bible clearly tells us that as humans, in our natural state, we are actually enemies with God. We are enemies because of our sin nature, because we rebelled against our own creator. You know, the Bible gives us a picture of human sinfulness as it's chaotic and broken and dark. See, we can't have peace because we don't have peace with God. In Romans, it says that all have sinned against God, and that that price of sin is death. See, this is why the longing of the human heart is peace. See, when Jesus comes before his disciples, he's not just saying hello. You know what Jesus is saying? He's saying, listen, my death and my resurrection has accomplished something in your life. It has settled a peace between you and God the Father. Would you hear Romans chapter 5, verse 10? It says, For if while we were enemies, we were enemies with God, we are reconciled to God by how? By the death of his son. Much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. Listen, church, you and I did nothing did absolutely nothing to broker that peace agreement between us and God. It was all Jesus. Jesus paid the price of our sins. He died so he can settle a peace between us and God the Father. Jesus is the one who has made us whole, and he has made us right with God. Church, would you know that Jesus is the Prince of Peace? And he came into this world to provide a way for me and you, sinners like us, to have peace with God. Jesus offers a calm in the midst of our chaos. He gives us hope in the midst of our brokenness and fear. And Jesus, the peace that he offers, it is permanent, it is secure, and it is ever lasting. Another way that Jesus gives us peace is actually peace between us and our own conscience. He gives us peace between us and our own conscience. You know, guilt and shame are very powerful emotions. And the sins of our life 
carry with us a guilty conscience. And for many of us, it's hard to forgive ourselves. It's hard to forget the sins and the mistakes that we've made. We can't put them behind us. We can't move forward. And of course, our enemy Satan is going to continue to remind us of the ways that we have fallen, remind us of our past. He continues to accuse us. Would you be encouraged by what Jesus' death and resurrection means for your guilty conscience? Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14 says, How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Hebrews 10, verse 22 says, Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Church, Jesus' resurrection, Jesus overcoming sin and death means that you and I can have the precious peace of a clear conscience. John 1 verse 9 says that if we confess our sins, oh, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all iniquity. You know, we have a really hard time with sin and guilt. Did you hear what Pastor John Piper says? He says this, peace doesn't mean that past sins cease to be pain- uh, painful. It means that they cease to be paralyzing. The pain may not be taken away immediately, but the penalty of sin is taken away immediately through Jesus Christ. And that makes it possible for us to heal. And it makes, us, makes it possible for us to move on with hope. Here's the third way that Jesus gives us peace. He gives us an inner peace amongst our outer hardship. An inner peace amongst our outer hardship. What do I mean by that? You know, if we look at these disciples, they were fearful and they were fearing death and then Jesus encourages them with his peace. And what we're going to see, we're going to see an amazing change in them. And over the next few days and weeks, as Jesus ascends into heaven, that he says that he's going to give them the promise of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. And here's the reality of their circumstance. That circumstance of life that caused them to be in such fear, to hide in a locked room, has not changed. Just because Jesus comes into that room, just because Jesus says, peace be with you, doesn't mean that the Jewish uh, rulers and leaders don't want them dead anymore. No, the circumstances on the outside has not changed. The reality for these disciples is that their life will be marked with suffering and persecution and ultimately death at the hands of these Jewish rulers. They were going to suffer for the sake of Christ. So then the question is, what makes them stop hiding? Because we know in the book of Acts, they're not hiding anymore. What makes them stop hiding? See, the Holy Spirit, the third person of God, it changes them so that they can gain a measure of inner peace amongst the outer hardship. It gives them an inner peace amongst the outer hardship. The Holy Spirit reminds them of who they are, that they are children of God, having peace with God the Father. The Holy Spirit reminds them of their hope and their future. And so in the midst of hardship, they can have peace and they can have joy. Would you hear Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 to 7? It says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So my road, my family and I, we've been here for about three and a half years. And can I tell you that I have so wonderfully witnessed this verse being fulfilled right here in our church. 
I have witnessed so many of you go through various trials and difficulties in life, and yet through it all, you have displayed a peace of God that surpasses all understanding. And it has encouraged me, and it's encouraged our family, and it's encouraging our body, and it is being a witness to an unbelieving world. Praise God for that. We said Jesus gives us peace. Well, how do we receive this peace? To receive this peace, we need to receive Jesus because Jesus is our peace. Romans chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It is only through Jesus that we can have peace with God, a peace that surpasseth all understanding, a peace that is everlasting. And I pray that if you are here this morning and you do not know Jesus, you're here and you're listening and you're thinking through things, would you know what a wonderful opportunity that this is this morning? It's a means of grace and mercy given to you by God. Would you receive the peace of God? Would you receive Jesus Christ this morning? You know, before we move on from the peace that Jesus gives I just want to focus for a couple minutes on what the peace of Jesus actually produces in our life. We see it right here in this passage. John 20, verse 20 says, Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. They were glad. They had joy. The peace of God produces a joy that is unlike anything that we can find in this world. You know, I love when we can see a scripture passage fulfilled. Earlier in John chapter 16, before Jesus goes to the cross, he tells his disciples something. In chapter 16, verse 20, it says, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn to joy. Every single part of that verse was fulfilled. When Jesus visits his disciples as the resurrected Messiah of God, when he shows them his hands and his, his side, their, their fear turned to gladness and their sorrow turned to joy, exactly as Jesus said it would. See, the presence of Jesus transformed their attitude from sadness to gladness. True everlasting joy can only be found in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. But here's a, a question for all of us. Are we looking for joy and happiness in Christ, or are we looking for it in all the wrong places? You know, throughout the Gospels, we hear Jesus say, come to me, and you will receive peace, you will receive joy, you will receive everlasting life. And God wants us to be happy, church. He wants us to have joy, but he wants us to find that joy in and through Jesus Christ. And the reality is many times, rather than finding joy in Jesus, we would much rather settle for joy from much lesser things in this world. I'm sure you've heard this quote from C.S. Lewis. He says this, If we consider the unblushing promises of reward and the staggering nature of of the rewards promised in the Gospels, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what it's meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. Church, Jesus gives us peace so our fear and sadness can turn into joy. Here's the second thing that we see Jesus give his disciples. Jesus gives us purpose. He gives us purpose. See, without having peace with God first, we can't actually fulfill the purpose that God has for us. Peace of, with God is foundational. 
And I heard a preacher say this, if you don't have peace with God, we're going to take all the other gifts that God gives to us and we're going to try to make peace with them. But if we have peace with God, then what does, what does Jesus give as our purpose in life? Would you hear John 20, verse 21? Jesus said to them, again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. Church, Jesus is saying, if you have peace with God, then you, like me, are a sent one. That's the ultimate purpose in our life. As Jesus was obedient to the purpose of God the Father, we should be obedient to the purpose that God has for us, which is to be sent to the world. If we have put our faith and trust in Jesus, then part of our identity of being a child of God is actually to be a sent one. And see, Jesus here, he's not telling his disciples in this passage that, listen, my mission is over now. Once I ascend into heaven, I'm going to kick back. I'm going to put my feet up. I'm going to drink a pina colada. But Jesus isn't telling his disciples that they are, they are going to replace his mission. No. Jesus will and always be the sent one who came into the world to save the world from their sins. We're not called to take over Jesus' mission, but as Jesus sends us to an unbelieving world, he sends us to proclaim the truth of who he, who he is and what he has done. And how his ministry, that's how his ministry continues through us as us being sent ones. See, only Jesus, by his work on the cross and by dying and resurrecting from the grave, can actually forgive people and give people eternal life. We don't have that power. And so you might ask then, what does verse 23 mean when it says, if you forgive, forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. And if you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. And this verse is highly debated and it's controversial. And I am not going to, you know, end this debate or slow it down or change it in any way. But in all honesty, church, I don't think this has to be controversial or debated. I believe that this is connected with our purpose to be sent ones. See, when we go out to an unbelieving world and we live out the truth of the gospel in our life, and when we tell people our story, the story that Jesus came into the world to save us from our sins, that through Jesus we have peace with God the Father, that Jesus died for the penalty of our sins, that is Jesus speaking through us. And if people hear and believe and receive the truth of this gospel message, that Jesus is going to be speaking through us, then their sins are forgiven. And if they do not believe and receive this message, then forgiveness is withheld from them. It's not that we have the power to forgive. It's Jesus has the power. But as we proclaim this message, we proclaim that there is forgiveness through Jesus Christ. Church, I was so humbled this week as I was going through this that why does God even want to use us? Why does God want to task us with continuing this mission to preach the good news of Jesus to the world? Listen, I was thinking about this. If I was running to be the president of the United States and I wanted my mission that I'm going to bring hope and change and peace and all these things, who am I going to ask to be a part of my group to get that message out? Am I going to ask people who, who, when things get hard, they run away? When things get hard, they're going to hide in a locked room? Or am I going to ask people who are just like, yeah, man, I'm all in for this. I believe everything you say. I'm going to go all in. Who does Jesus say this to? Jesus says this to the disciples who denied him when he was on the cross. He says it to people that were hiding in fear. Why does he want to use us? He, use, he wants to use us because of our story of what he has done for us. He has taken us from death to life. 
He has taken us from sinner to forgiven. He has taken us from without having peace to having peace. That church is our story. That is why Jesus wants to use us. That is why he wants to send us into the world. What a privilege and honor it is, church, to be ambassadors of Christ into this world. I know that the thought of being on mission can be very scary and, and it's daunting. But I find great encouragement that being a sent one is part of our DNA as children of God. It's part of who we are as a child of God, is to be sent. You know, I found an article that was uh, written by Heather Holman and the Gospel Coalition. I'm sure some of you have seen it or read it. I think we've used it in some of our GCMs. But she says this about being sent ones. You know, we, she says, we don't have to know all the answers. We don't have to be extroverts or have a seminary training. Instead, we can know with confidence that God sends us into the lives of others around us. Why does God have you where you are? Why does God have you in the place that you work, in the school that you go, in the communities that you are? Well, he has you there to be a sent one. Would you hear four practical steps that Heather Holman mentions about practicing this scent life? Really practical, very simple. First, notice the people around you. It's so simple, right? We go through life and we think about us. We think about our families. For a moment, what if we just step back and said, who lives around me? Who goes to school with my kids? Who are, what are the things that are going around with my coworkers? Notice the people around you. Two, pray for them specifically by name. Be intentional, asking God to bring peace into their life, asking God to use us to be a sent one to share this message of hope. Three, take steps of faith to engage others in meaningful conversation. Listen, it's hard for us to share our story and talk about what God has done if we don't even know their name, right? If we don't even know what they like or what they're into, and so just take steps to engage them in conversation. And step four, share your story of gospel transformation in authentic and natural ways. Church, do you believe that you have a story to tell? Do we believe that we have a story that's worth telling to an unbelieving world? A story of how God has changed our life. Church, let's pray for each other as we are sent into our communities and to our workplaces and to our schools. That we would have the strength to share our stories of how Jesus changed our life. Here's our last point as we close off this morning. Jesus gives us power. He gives us power. In John 20, verse 22, it says, When he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Thank God that he does not leave us alone to accomplish being sent ones on our own. We can't do it. It's, a, it's, it's too hard of a task. But Jesus literally sends a helper. He is with us. God is with us. He's not leaving us or forsaking us. In the book of Acts, we read how God pours out the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, when they receive it, they will receive power. And the work of the Holy Spirit is to empower us and to encourage us. The Holy Spirit allows us to be sent ones and do what we cannot do in our own strength and ability. You know, the best picture of the power of the Holy Spirit is the disciples themselves. We remember that they were afraid in a locked room. And just a few days and a week after Jesus ascends, and they receive the power of the Holy Spirit. If you were here and we walked through the book of Acts, what, what did we see with these disciples? These are the same people that were in a room afraid. And we see that this group of people who was changed by God empowered by the Holy Spirit, oh, they change the world. 
They change the world. They are no longer scared, but they're emboldened to go preach Christ crucified. And they're doing that in the midst of, uh, of persecution, in the midst of death threats. And they are having this boldness to preach Christ crucified. Do you know that any one of us that's sitting here today, that if we say we're a child of God, that we've put our trust in Jesus, it's because they started something that moved across the world. That every single one of us know and heard about Jesus Christ because somebody in our life was changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ, understood the peace of God, and that they were empowered and given a purpose to be a sent one, and in their love for us, shared this good news of Jesus Christ being crucified. And as we have received Jesus, what Jesus is saying, well, you now go be a sent one. Continue in this, of this history of us going to an unbelieving world and sharing Jesus Christ, who died for us and was resurrected from the grave, who has ascended into heaven, seated at the right hand of God. That is who Jesus wants us to be. He has given us peace. He has given us a purpose. And church, he has given us the power to complete that purpose. Let's pray. Lord, we are so thankful for your word this morning. For how do we say thanks to you, Lord Jesus, that you, you went to the cross you bled and you died and you suffered, not for your sins, but for ours. And that through your death, you have accomplished in us a peace with God. We are no longer enemies with you, God the Father. Those of us who have put our trust in Jesus, we are a part of your family. We are children of God, paid by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your peace we thank you that you would give us the purpose to be sent ones, that you would want to use people like us. And we thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit that you have given to us. Holy Spirit, would you strengthen us as a, as a church to be a light to this dark world? Would you help us to share our story, to be a sent one to our city and to our neighborhoods and to our schools? Or would you give us the strength to live this out? We ask this in your precious name. Amen.